that um, the key point to notice about the airport really is that it would increase the whole footprint of humans on Antarctica by 40%. So at the moment, there are like 60 to 70 stations in the Antarctic, and this project is really massive. And that is the reason why the foundation is at all engaged in Antarctica, because we are planning to stop this project, which is not supported by scientists, but mainly by geopolitical uh, strategy institutes. But in particular, um, why we're meeting here this evening is to speak about climate justice and yeah, to prepare for that action day on the 23rd of June. And I'll light and drop in the chat the links to the website where you can find more information on that. Yeah, uh, we are recording this webinar. We would like to record it because most of the people who are engaged with the Bob Brown Foundation in Tasmania or in Australia. They're actually sleeping right now and I hope they will watch it later. Um, so this, this is the reason actually the recording is quite important for us this time. So uh, we have four panelists today um, who will like shine a light on Antarctica from different aspects from different views. The first one who is speaking is uh, Dr. Thomas Wonge. He is a physical scientist and he will speak about the physical side. Then we will have, um, yeah, a look from the social sciences who is Alejandra Mancia, who is hopefully joining us soon after. And then we will look how sea level rise um, affects communities around the globe and speak with Suhanwa from uh, Bangladesh before we turn to Hilda who will speak about fighting fossil fuel infrastructure and who is part of Fridays for Future Uganda. So yeah, um, there's a possibility to ask questions in the chat or through the Q&A function. We'll first let all the panelists speak and then uh, you could ask them questions. And then I'm gonna speak a bit more about the action day and we can discuss that a little bit. So I hope it's gonna be quite uh, quite informal. I think most of the people who are joining here have heard a little bit about the action day already and are thinking what they potentially could organize or do. And we will give you some, some ideas and some options for that. So, um, yeah, now I would like to introduce Thomas, Dr. Thomas Ronge from the Alfred Wegener Institute um, and give him the floor to, to show us what, us on, what he can tell us about the physical sciences and the climate crisis in Antarctica. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. So let's see if uh, screen sharing works for me. Hope you can see my, my screen. Can, I, can you see it? Okay, I see Jakob is giving me the thumbs up. That's very good. So yeah, I want to tell you about my flight into the Death Star or why I once took a helicopter to fly into an Antarctic glacier and what this weird title might have to do with Antarctica, with climate change, with sea level rise. So a few words to me, I'm a geologist, a scientist at the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Bremerhaven, Germany and in normal, non-COVID years, um, I spend a few months every single year on one of the bigger research vessels like the Polarstern, which is the one where Carola was an officer on uh, the Sonne or the International Research Drillship Joides Resolution. So 420.07 ppm parts per million, that's the amount of CO2 that was measured on June 1st in the atmosphere. And probably most of you will have heard people say, yeah, but climate was never stable. It always went up and down between glaciers, so cold periods and interglacials, so warm periods. It's all natural cycles, so why do we care for this? So for the last 800,000 years, we have the most precise record. And you can see that it is true, it was never stable. It is in cycles getting colder, warmer with less CO2 and more CO2. And these cycles with an amplitude of about 100,000 years are called Milankovitch cycles, 
for Milutin Milankovic, a Yugoslavian geophysicist who described them for the first time. And these are orbital parameters. So basically how the planet wobbles through space. The first one is called obliquity. So the actual tilt of the planet. The second one is called precession. So how much the axis wobbles. And the third one is called eccentricity. So how round or how elliptic the path of the earth around the sun is. And these parameters together, they basically uh, determine how much solar energy, so how many watts per square meter hit our planet, in particular in the important polar latitudes. But if it's the orbital parameters driving glacials and interglacials, so is there no human-made climate change? So again, if we look at this record for the last 800,000 years, we have records far, far beyond this, but this is the most precise that we have. We see that during the glaciers, during the cold periods, CO2 was basically always at about 180 ppm parts per million. And during the interglaciers, the warm periods, like the one that we are living in today, it was basically never more than 280 ppm. And now if we look at the last 150 to 200 years, we see that we have basically added more than a full glacial interglacial amount of CO2 to the atmosphere. So only if we understand how the climate evolved in the past, what natural cycles are, only then can we determine what is human-made climate change and what are natural processes. And only then can we get better predictions for the climate change of the future. And as geologists, I'm working on two different topics. I want to understand where was the CO2 during the glaciers and how was it released back to the atmosphere. And the second one with a more Antarctic focus even as the one I want to talk to you about today is the stability of Antarctic glaciers. So we want to understand how stable or instable have they been during time periods that were warmer than we see today. And to analyze this, the West Antarctic uh, ice sheet is in particular of interest for our scientists. And in 2017, we went to the Amundsen Sea where you find the Pine Island Glacier and its neighbor Thwaites. And these glaciers were coined by the media as the so-called doomsday glaciers. So these alone, if they would collapse completely, could raise global sea level by one and a half to two and a half meters. And Pine Island Glacier alone loses about 63 billion tons of ice every single year. So 63 billion tons, that's pretty incomprehensible. So if you look at a satellite picture of New York City and New Jersey, you see the Manhattan Island there. And if you now would pile 63 billion tons of ice on top of Central Park, you would get a column of solid ice that is 21.4 kilometers high. So twice the altitude of cruising jetliners. And this is the amount that this glacier loses every single year. And we want to understand how stable or unstable is this glacier on the time periods where climate might be one and a half, two degrees warmer. So we look in times back in time, uh, at times uh, in the past where it was two degrees warmer to see how this glacier behaves. And when we approached Pine Island Glacier after about a week at sea, from several kilometers distance, we could see the ice shelf, which is the swimming part of the glacier and the carving front where the icebergs are basically born. And then we saw these whole structures in this carving front. And a colleague of mine said to me, like, whoa, this looks like meltwater exit structures. And everyone from us paused because meltwater exit structures, that would be uh, would mean that the glacier is melting on top and the water is flowing through the glacier off to the sea. So far, these uh, floating glaciers are only melting from underneath where warm, warm is three degrees, but for a glacier that's warm, so where warm water is melting them from underneath and surface melt would mean that surface temperatures are so high that melt water is forming. And we know this, for example, from the Larsen B ice shelf. When 2002 satellites observed these surface melt structures, that's the blue spots that you see here. And in about two months, this whole ice shelf basically exploded and was completely obliterated. And these ice shelves, the smaller one at Larsen B and the big ones at Pine Island and Thwaites, 
They are like caps on a bottle of beer. They are holding back the glaciers on land from flowing quickly into the oceans and raising global sea levels. So if they disappear, it is absolutely worrying. So we were worried by these structures and we knew from satellite pictures that a gigantic crack had formed in the hinterland about 12 kilometers from the ocean it was 30 kilometers long, several hundred meters wide. And to investigate this, the next day, weather looked good. We took one of the helicopters, flew along the carving front for about 60 kilometers until we reached the position that we've marked via GPS on the day before where we saw these structures in the glacier. And looking up close, we could see no sign of meltwater anywhere on the surface. And we were pretty certain that these structures are simply crevasses, so cracks in the glacier that were then cut open by an iceberg that formed. And then we continued further inland because we wanted to investigate the glacier. We wanted to see how uh, the crack in the glacier, we wanted to see how it forms on the perimeter. So these structures where it's just about to open. And then we were very interested in finding out if there's seawater in it, because seawater would basically mean that over the 30 kilometers that this crack is long, the whole glacier, which is 400 meters thick, would have cracked and seawater would have come into the glacier already and an iceberg, a gigantic iceberg would form in the next few weeks or month. So we followed this crack with a helicopter, the crack became wider, deeper, was several hundred meters wide so that we could safely go deeper with a helicopter to investigate it. And when the walls became higher and wider, it reminded me of the scene in Star Wars when Luke and the rebels went into the trench of the Death Star to ultimately destroy it. And speaking of destruction, we could see seawater in this crack. So we knew that the glacier was cracked over these 400 meters and that a gigantic iceberg is about to form, which I have to say is a natural process, but I will come to this in just a few minutes. So we followed the glacier, uh, the crack in the glacier towards its end. And on the way back, we landed on an iceberg to take samples before we continued our flight back to Polarstern. So what you see here is Polarstern, Germany's largest research vessel, about 120 meters long, being completely dwarfed by this glacier and seeing nothing but ice 400 meters thick there, several kilometers thick in the inland, was absolutely mesmerizing, humbling, but also terrifying to see all the ice that can potentially raise global sea level. And while we didn't find any meltwater structures, was not really, um, a reason to relax because until 2003, the glacier carved, so icebergs were born in this geometry where the yellow line is, so a bit before that in the years before. But then in 2015, it made a gigantic jump 20 kilometers inland, the geometry, uh, geometry changed towards this blue line, which is the 2015 event. And people, scientists were wondering, was this a one-time event and the glacier will advance? or is the glacier now in a new state and it's further and further retreating? Then in 2017, when we were there and followed this 30 kilometer crack, which is the red line, it was basically proven that the glacier is in this new state of retreat. In 2018, the next iceberg was born. The iceberg that we investigated, B44, was basically half the size of the city of Berlin, just for you to get into perspective. Then in 2020, the next iceberg formed even a few kilometers further inland. So this glacier is currently retreating. If it's on a runaway retreat, we don't know yet, but this is one of the topics we are investigating. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, is having different emission pathways. So these are amounts of CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere, and then they make model predictions of how the climate might change under these pathways. What you see on the left side is on top Greenland, on, on the bottom is Antarctica, and this is the mass loss. So how many billion tons have these um, ice caps lost since 2002. And on the right side, I want you to focus on this red triangle and the blue triangle. These are modeling scenarios that were made by the IC, uh, IPCC for the so-called RCP 8.5 scenario, which is the doomsday or business as usual scenario. So if we blow up as much CO2 as we want to, like what we're doing today, 
and they predicted that the Antarctic ice cap in red and the Greenland ice cap in blue will, made, uh, will melt somewhere in this triangle. And then what you see on the left and on the right side as the red curve and blue curve is what was observed by satellites. So the models were absolutely spot on, maybe even on the conservative side, predicting how these glaciers will melt. And also these models were spot on for sea level rise, which is this green triangle or this green curve that you see in the center. And the black line is the measured sea level rise. So these models absolutely working perfectly in this RPC, uh, RCP 8.5 scenario. This is Bremerhaven on the right side, the city where I live during a storm surge, Pine Island Glacier on the left side, and every centimeter of sea level rise will make storm surges like this one on the right side more expensive, more difficult to handle. The red areas here for Bangladesh on the left side and for northern Germany where I am on the right side are the areas that will be below sea level in the year 2050. That doesn't mean they are flooded, so many of the areas here in northern Germany already are underneath the sea level. But if the sea level rises more and more, it's getting harder to defend against the rising sea level. And while some rich countries might have a small fighting chance to uh, defend against the rising sea level, poorer countries won't have this chance. So we have to act on climate change right now, and therefore I'm a member of the so-called Arby's for Future, which is a member of the Scientists for Future um, group, where we basically do outreach events like this one, where we talk about climate change and the ramifications. We contribute for, uh, to climate marches, give scientific presentations, then people can talk to us about the scientific background. And in COVID times, we run the YouTube channel Wissenschaft fürs Wohnzimmer, which is um, living room science, science for your living room, where we also give presentations in German and English. The next one, uh, 8.30 European Central Time on YouTube today will be an English one. And so we do these things to raise awareness in the general public for this topic. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to write me an email or contact me on Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. That was a great, a great to see Antarctica once again, even in some pictures. Obviously a place most of us can can never get to and, and understand a little bit about the science. And of course, um, all the emissions come from somewhere, for sure. And when we are looking um, at the Antarctic Treaty system. There are at the moment only 29 nations that are allowed to vote and make the management decisions about the Antarctic. And as many of you can imagine, they're the rich nations, they're the settler nations, the big nations like the US, Russia, China, the European Union, New Zealand, Australia, and some of the um, South American countries, uh, Brazil, Argentine, Chile, and so on, South Africa as well. But there's none of um, or very few countries from the global south actually. And what we will see most likely in two weeks on the 23rd of June, we will see all these nations claiming how wonderful the protection of Antarctica is, is working. And we have to say, yes, the Antarctic Treaty is great in the way that the nations are really cooperating. Um, it was signed during the Cold War was the idea to prevent any sort of militarization or war in the Antarctic. And that hasn't happened until today. Instead, it was promoting science and cooperation. And in fact, there is a lot of cooperation regarding science in the Antarctic. But on the other hand, since these 60 years, of course, the emissions have risen tremendously. And they're rising, of course, uh, until today. They're not even close to stopping or getting uh, any less, unfortunately. And um, this meeting, which we will see in two weeks, the 60 years anniversary of the treaty will be hosted by France. And of course, it will be now hosted online because many people still cannot uh, travel for the foreseeable future, of course. And so we will not be able to do any protests in France or anywhere. But I think it is a good moment to invite somebody who can 
tell us uh, from her perspective about the fossil fuel industry and the importance of France. And it is why I invited Hilda Nakabuya, who is from Fridays for Future in Uganda. And in Uganda, the um, all company Total, which of course is French, is just building a new pipeline through the heart of Africa. And Hilda, I would love if you could tell us um, about this pipeline, which I think a lot of people have not heard about yet. And what, what you organize and what you do against it. You're still muted. Sorry about that. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hilda and I come from Uganda. I'm a climate activist and I'm an African from a region that has been severely affected by the climate crisis, that is East Africa. And I live in one of the countries that has nothing to do with the causing of the climate crisis, but we are already facing the first hand effects of it. We are bearing the brunt. My country, Uganda, is yet to build its first ever oil pipeline. And thanks to Total, they think they are doing us a favor, but then they are killing our future because the oil pipeline has come at a time when the world is switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And then developing countries like France are turning to renewable energy. So us, the poor countries, with the help of corporations from developed countries are forced to see a future in fossil fuels, yet it does not even exist. So I'll tell you a little bit about this uh, oil pipeline that Total is planning to build. So it has many negative impacts, which I'll start with. So as currently planned, the ECOP, which is the East African crude oil pipeline, will pass through 178 villages in Uganda and then 231 villages in Tanzania. It will lead to massive physical and economic displacement. An estimated 14,000 households across Uganda and Tanzania have already lost their land as a result of the pipeline. Hundreds of families will need to be resettled and thousands more will even be affected by the associated oil development projects. Uh, between 2018 and 2019, Total placed cutoff debts for compensation on the properties of 5,000 households in Uganda whose land is being acquired to develop the pipeline. Through the cutoff, uh, through the cutoff debt, Total stopped people from using their land to grow income generating and perennial food crops. And in addition to stopping them from setting up new developments, to debt, the people are not yet compensated amidst the above limitations. This has left people Im impoverished because the impacts of this have increased poverty. And this poverty is basically being felt mostly by women, parents, children, and the elderly. Because my country, Uganda, is uh, an agriculture-based country. We survive on uh, planting. So if you refuse people to use their land for growing, then what will they survive on? This is uh, a very big threat to us. It's also, the ECOP does not only have threats to our agriculture and our livelihoods, but also to the water resources and biodiversity. Um, um, we have the severe impacts on local communities and their rights because the pipeline threatens one of the world's most ecological diverse wildlife rich regions. It threatens Uganda's oldest and largest natural reserve. We, we, we call it Uganda's pride. It's called the Maxson Falls. It's, it has the falls and then it has the national park as well. This would be opened up to large scale oil extraction at a time when the world is acting to urgently reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. Nearly 2000 kilo, square kilometers of protected wildlife mm -hmm. habitats will be negatively impacted by the East African crude oil pipeline project. And in Uganda, the pipeline will impact the, uh, we, we have the Tala reserves, we have Bogoma forest reserve, uh, the later home of large groups of Eastern chimpanzees, some 500 square kilometers of wildlife corridors for the Eastern chimpanzees and African elephants are also likely to be uh, severely degraded. And then in Tanzania, the oil pipeline will pass through key biodiversity areas including the Harumbo Game Reserve, 
uh, including Wembere Spit um, Kibai Diversity Area. Uh, it will also include other parks, uh, some rivers along um, the, the Rift Valley, and it will also put uh, two important ecological or, um, or biologically significant marine areas at very high risk of huge amount of oil to be transported offshore up to the Tanga port. So the project will also directly impact several, several wetlands, including Makshan Falls, Albert Delta, uh, wetland, uh, Na 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 Nabajuzi wetland, among others, there are quite many. Uh, also, this wetland will not only impact wetlands, but uh, we have Lake Victoria, which is shared among the East African uh, countries. This Lake Victoria is the second largest freshwater body, and um, it's going to face great risk. It's already at risk because research shows that in 100 years, it will be no more, it will be dried out. So more effects from the oil pipeline will just make everything worse. And in case of an oil spill, 40 million lives are at risk because they depend on this. So it's very worrying because it's a source of water and also livelihoods. And uh, this project will also put national parks, wetlands, rivers, lakes, uh, not to mention livelihoods, of course, of millions of people. So it's dangerous and this is unacceptable to us. Um, the, it has undermining efforts uh, to combat climate change because according to the IPPC, we should limit global warming below 1.5 in order to live a good life. And the construction of the East African crude oil pipeline will unlock commercial exploitation of multiple oil fields in landlocked countries like mine. The further expansion of the fossil fuel industry, including the construction of new oil pipelines and related infrastructure is incompatible with the goals of the Paris Agreement and manifestly irresponsible at a time when the catastrophic impacts of global warming are becoming increasingly clear. This is a time where we need to reflect on our actions and act because we are left with less time. But at this time, French's oil giant Total is planning to build more oil pipelines while saying they are becoming environmentally uh, stable. So this is unaccepted. And according to the project's website, the ECOP will carry 200 and, uh, sorry, yeah, 216,000 barrels of crude oil per day at plateau production. So the emissions from burning the oil would release an estimated 34.3 billion metric tons of carbon equivalent per year. This is an amount that drafts the current annual emissions of Uganda and Tanzania combined and is roughly equivalent to the carbon footprint of nearly nine coal-fired power plants. So this is what is happening. This is what Total wants to do in such countries not only my country, but also Tanzania and then other Central African countries. So we are saying this is unacceptable. And with that, we started the Stop ECOP campaign, which is the Stop East African Crude Oil Pipeline campaign. Together with other activists globally and other organizations, we are trying to do um, a lot of work, a lot of things about this, because we need to show the world what is really happening. Total is saying it's clean, but then it's not being really clean. And recently, um, to, uh, French President, uh, Mr. Macron wrote a letter to my president, Mr. Museveni, congratulating Um, hello, can you hear me? Uh, we lost you for a moment. Could you please repeat your last sentence about the letter from Mr. Macron? Okay, uh, yeah, Mr. Macron wrote a letter to my president congratulating him about the elections and also about signing the total project. And this shows that um, 
the president of Total is endorsing this Total project to take place in Uganda, in my country. And yet he's the same president who is supporting renewable energy. So this is um, a bit too fast because if you can't be a saint and then be a devil itself, you have to choose one. So we see that a lot um, is going on behind the back and the world needs to know that uh, we are facing massive trouble here because people are not deciding. And what we need to do is to make concrete actions in order to have this uh, oil pipeline stopped as soon as possible. Because this oil pipeline is proposed to, to cover about 1,445 1, kilometers. So it will run from my country, Uganda, and to the port of Tanzania. And if completed, it will be the, the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline in the world. So the project bears grave risks to the people and to nature, both in Uganda, in Tanzania, but also as the world at large, because people are already displaced and their incomes and livelihoods are already affected. So unacceptable risks to water biodiversity and natural habitats, as well as unlocking a new source of carbon emissions that will either prove financially unviable or produce unacceptable climate harm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this, uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, um, Hilda, for showing us, you know, one, one example of this typical behavior, how European nations to claim to be very green um, and are at the same time very destructive and how, um, from my perspective, if how Antarctica is also connected because if we want to do something for the ecosystem of Antarctica, we have to reduce the emissions and that means stopping very concrete projects that are happening right now, projects like that infrastructure project. So. Um, can, can you tell us shortly, like if people are now wanting to get engaged against the pipeline, um, I assume you can find the information on the website, but is there any other way that people can get engaged in, in your campaign to support you and the other activists? So yes, there are ways of getting engaged. First, you can um, uh, first read about the ECOP by visiting the website, of course, get to fa get familiar with all that is happening and what you can do. There are also steps of what you can do, how you can organize, how you can mobilize, what you can, you know, the actions you can take. But uh, what we really need right now is spreading the awareness, spreading the information for people to know about this, because this won't only affect us, people in Africa, but also the world at large. And this will also basically affect Antarctica because it's already melting at a very high rate. Uh, we have like action days as the Fridays for Future group. And we, we normally um, share this information on our Twitter in case we have an action. So you can already join our strikes or our actions. And we, we have weekly calls you can join those. Um, you can support in any way you can. You can have your own climate strike in your country, but with a stop ECOP, uh, you know, um, sorry, uh, hashtag, and then you can have a strike in front of uh, the Total Gas Station with the ECOP placard, stop ECOP. And you can share this on social media. You can share this with other people who don't know about this. Yeah, there is a lot to be done, and we can we can do this. Great, thank you so much. I hope people will check that out and and support you. And yeah, I'm really happy that uh, Alejandra has made it. Apparently, there was a small issue with the timing. Um, Professor Alejandra Mancia is. Um, working at the philosophy department at the University of Oslo in Norway. And she has been leading a project, uh, philo uh, political philosophy looks to Antarctica in the last years. So she is an expert 
in that sense from the social sciences and she will speak about Antarctica from that side, how it is governed, what is the aspect of justice there, how could the governance potentially be improved. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, she made it uh, welcome. Thanks so much, Carol. I'm so sorry. I totally, yeah, I thought Helsinki time and Oslo time were the same thing, but obviously they are not. So I was like rehearsing very, you know, like I have time still. <laughs> so I'm really sorry, but I'm glad I made it. I, I don't know if I could, can I share the screen? I mean, is it worth it to have other people share it or should I just talk? Yeah, okay, maybe I'll share a screen just because of the habit. Uh, let me, there. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so first I should say, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I've been working on this project for three years now and it's supposed to be over very soon, but I hope to keep working. I think there's still a lot to do. Uh, but just to give you like a bit of context, I, I'm interested in territorial rights and especially rights over natural resources. And I found fascinating and weird that philosophers have not really looked systematically at the case of Antarctica, even though it's a very unique case to look at just because territorial rights are not settled and they're, it's full of resources. It's a wilderness area still. So for all those reasons, I think it was super interesting to look into that. I don't think I'll say much about how the Antarctic Treaty system works or in, nothing like that, but I was thinking rather of because you're worried about Antarctica and how to protect it, I think that uh, it's high time this year, especially because it's 30 years after the environmental protocol was signed, uh, to reread the protocol, but with an anthropocenic lens. So uh, I know that, or I'm guessing that maybe many of you are thinking maybe the, the Antarctic Treaty and its related instruments are inadequate and it's not sufficient to protect this place and we need to think more radically. And I thought like, okay, let me reread the protocol and see what happens. And actually, I think that there is quite a lot of radical potential in the protocol already, but it hasn't been actualized. So I just wanted to throw to you three uh, parts of the protocol where I think that that potential could be actualized. Uh, and so, yeah, the first thing is uh, in Article 2. So in Article 2, when uh, the protocol lays down the objectives and the designation uh, of the protocol, what it is for, it says the parties commit themselves to the comprehensive protection of the Antarctic environment and dependent and associated ecosystems and hereby designate Antarctic as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. But the red letters, the expression the Antarctic environment and dependent and associated ecosystems is repeated 19 times in the protocol. So that's no mistake, that's no slip, uh, that they meant it. And now the question is, what does this really mean for how the protocol is exercised? So everything in the protocol refers to the Antarctic Treaty area and conservation is going to be in the Antarctic Treaty area and measures are taken in the Antarctic Treaty area. But if they're serious or if the protocol is serious about its end, uh, I think that this is basically pointing to the fact that dependent and associated ecosystems require taking measures way beyond Antarctica and Antarctica itself. So for the protection of Antarctica, presumably you will need to protect much more than Antarctica or look at how you're doing things way beyond Antarctica. So this is the first idea uh, that I want to share with you and leave it to you so that you think about it. What would it mean to really do this um, if this is the main objective stated in Article 2? The second point is about uh, the environmental principles. This is Article 3. And one of the things that Article 3 says, and as far as I know, and I've asked a few international lawyers, this is the only legal instrument, environmental legal instrument, that says explicitly that the thing to be protected has intrinsic value. And the intrinsic value of Antarctic, it says, shall be a fundamental consideration in the planning and conduct of all activities in the Antarctic Treaty area. Now, intrinsic value is, jargon, is part of the jargon of philosophers, and the normal contrast is between intrinsic and instrumental value. And if we say that Antarctica has instrumental value, we can basically mean, well, scientists go there, get interesting information, and that helps us. So we need Antarctica as a means for something else that is good. 
But if it says that it, Antarctica has intrinsic value, what it's basically saying is that it has value in itself, just like humans have value in itself, and therefore we do not do certain things to humans. And that's where the whole discourse of human rights comes from, that we have dignity. That's the, the same idea. But this is never spelled out, it's never defined, and the implications, implications are not really drawn. So second question for you, what would it mean to sit down and think what it what intrinsic value for Antarctica would imply in terms of our actions and how we behave towards Antarctica. Um, there is um, recently uh, a Chilean friend philosopher published a paper. We were uh, we uh, just edited a volume on the 30 years of the Antarctic Treaty, and he just published a paper in Spanish, which is about what it means, what this intrinsic value expression means. Uh, but he um, interprets it as uh, non-human animals in Antarctica having that value. So for him, it's the non-human animals that should be the focus and the protection therefore should be geared towards them. But of course, if you're more of an environmental or ecocentric, you could think that the whole ecosystem has intrinsic value or maybe the landscape as it is, or you, uh, you name it. So this discussion has to be uh, undertaken, I think, and it hasn't been done uh, yet. And the third and last point, uh, this comes from uh, Annex 2 on the conservation of uh, Antarctic fauna and flora. And in Article 4, it says that no species of animal or plant not native to the Antarctic Treaty area shall be introduced onto land or ice shelves or into water in the Antarctic Treaty area, except in accordance with a permit. Now, I think this article reveals like how deeply ingrained our anthropocentrism is. This article was never meant to apply to humans, but we are mammals, we are definitely not Antarctic mammals, and yet we have to give no reasons to go to Antarctica. You still need a permit, you still need to sign some papers, but it's pretty easy. And if you were a tourist and you just feel that this is your next exotic destination, go for it. I think that this should be read again. Uh, and this is probably, yeah, as I said, I find that this is so telling that they, they don't really need even the, they don't even feel the need to give a justification or say humans are an exception uh, in this annex. And we're not considering ourselves as mammals for the purposes of the annex. Uh, it's just like that, it doesn't apply to us. I think that uh, the burden of proof maybe should be on humans uh, to show why it's a good thing that we are going to Antarctica if we wish, uh, whereas other mammals, can't or plants or anything else really, no other species except us. So just summing up very quickly, I think that there is a mismatch, a clear mismatch between the stated purposes and the means to achieve them and that that has to be fixed, but maybe the resources are already there in the protocol. The second thing is that if the intrinsic value is already recognized, what are the moral and legal implications of this recognition? And the third is, let's please, ditch this narrow anthropocentrism and uh, spell it out at least. Uh, so if we want to be anthropocentric, let's say that we're going to be so, but not just assume it uh, with no, uh, uh, without, without uh, justification. Uh, yeah, so I think that I'll just end there. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alejandra. That's, that was very um, interesting. And I want to ask a, a question just for for the benefit of the listeners because when we met before uh, you mentioned that you you were born in the south of chile and oh, of course comparatively much closer to antarctica than most of us and chile is one of the countries that um, likes to claim a part of antarctica originally when the antarctic treaty was signed there were seven nations who were claiming a part of it um the UK is one, France is another, Chile, Argentina, there are also some of them. The claims, of course, overlapped and there was a dispute who really should own it. And with the Antarctic treaties, these were put on a hold. But actually, no of the nations, none of them has actually declared that they're stepping back from their claim. So I was really interested in your perspective um, because you mentioned that um, yeah, you don't think there should be national claims to Antarctica and maybe you could just uh, give us your reasoning for that once again. 
yeah. So first, if, if there is any Antarctic mammal here, it's probably me. So I should be accepted. <laughs> I should be accepted by nobody else. Yeah, I am from Punta Arenas, and that's still a long, long way. So when Chile makes this argument that we are so close, that's just like, no, we're not. It's two hours and a half by plane. That's pretty far. Uh, I th yeah, I have written a paper that describes like why I think that these claims are outrageous, uh, just because they used this the sector principle. So basically they applied the same principle that was used in the Arctic. Uh, but of course in the Arctic, there are people living and the countries are much closer in a way or the, and there are people living in the, 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 the Arctic uh, circle. There are no people living in Antarctic circle or at least no natives. Uh, and when these claims were made, so the UK made this first unilateral claim in 1908, pretty outrageously, they included a bit of Tierra del Fuego, so they had to reissue it in 1917. And then came the other Europeans, and at the very end, Chile and Argentina, which said that because Spain had uh, the potential claim to Antarctica given by the Pope 500 years ago, therefore, yeah, we Chileans and Argentinians, in a way, had inherited this claim when Chile and Argentina uh, were independent. I think that's just not good enough. And if it's good for something, it's maybe good to claim some little islands, some spots along the coast, but the whole continent, give me a break. So there, I don't think there is any way, morally speaking, uh, just, or even like commonsensically speaking, of justifying the whole chunks that these countries claimed. And the original claims were all, all the way to the pole, except for Norway. Uh, which I thought had done it because uh, this was generous in their part, but it was really because if they claimed all the way to the pole, they would have trouble in Svalbard with the Russians. So it was just a strategic decision. Uh, it was not that they didn't want to claim all the way to the pole. So I, I think that the, the, the yeah, uh, I don't need to repeat it all again. Uh, I think that the claims by the states really don't have any solid basis. Uh, except maybe if you want to say, okay, some meteorological stations, some little spots along the coast, uh, but the continent as such, yeah, there is no way, really. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's, that's an interesting perspective, uh, particularly to, to hear from you as someone who has grown up quite, quite a bit closer, as, as I said, than, than most people who are in this webinar. I, kind of assume that uh, Sohanur, who I was inviting, also might have had the time zone issue. Um, so maybe he, he will turn up. Um, so far, are there any, any questions for the speakers that we have here? Uh, please feel free to drop any in the chat. I haven't seen any uh, so far. And I would just continue to, to speak about the action day a little bit, but if there are questions, then um, you know, just just write them in the chat, and we can um, we can read them out or write them. Uh, sorry, give you the speaking rights. So yeah, um, on June twenty third, we are planning an action day, which we are coordinating through the Bob Brown Foundation. That doesn't mean that we're trying to organize it everywhere, but we are just providing information on helping groups of people to do something because um, really the point is that the Antarctic Treaty System is one of those very few systems I think which doesn't receive a lot of criticism from activists and I think that needs to change particularly when we're seeing the moral obligation of the Antarctic nations to actually act on the climate crisis because um, the Antarctic Treaty actually regulates only what happens south of 60 degrees south. So many of the nations will go on and they will say, we, we are doing perfectly with the Antarctic Treaty. We're doing everything in Antarctica. We make this protection to not step on the mosses and whatnot. And you need a permit if you want to, I don't know, handle a penguin for science. We're doing all these great things. But at the same time, when you're looking at the 29 voting nations in particular and their historic accumulated CO2 emissions, then they have emitted about three quarters or more of the total historic emissions. So if these 29 nations, it's nearly the same as the G20, but slightly different, um, if they were really, really committed 
to protecting the ecosystem in Antarctica, which is really under threat uh, from the climate crisis, then they would need to reduce their emissions. So um, they're basically not admitting that they should be doing or they could be doing a lot more domestically. And of course, all of them have signed the Paris Agreement. And of course, none of them to this date are keeping to the Paris Agreement. But that is kind of the point. In many, many places, activists are luckily coming in and they're, um, they're putting pressure on the governments and on the fossil fuel companies and on the finance system and so on. But the Antarctic Treaty System is actually to this point still one of the areas which is quite removed from people because, I mean, it's obviously very distant. A lot of people have never been there. And where activism as such or climate activism is missing so far. And that is what we hope to build over time um, and where we would like to network, uh, particularly in the nations with groups and citizens and initiatives uh, where voting rights exist, but also, of course, in places which are affected and which are somehow connected to Antarctica. And we do think this, for example, includes places like Bangladesh, where sea level rise will be a huge issue, even if, of course, the sea level rise there is a combination of many factors. Antarctica is just uh, one of them. So a thermal expansion, of course, a big thing. But still, we could argue that Bangladesh and many, many coastal places around the world are actually um, interlocked and dependent on Antarctica in that we have to see Antarctica not as an isolated place, but connected to the rest of the globe. First through emissions, like Hilda was speaking about the AirCop pipeline, about Total, the fossil fuel industry and so on. They're headquartered in the global north. The projects, for example, are taking place in Uganda and the impacts will be in Antarctica, but also might be, for example, in Bangladesh. So. Antarctica is, in effect, it's globally connected and the Southern Ocean, sometimes there are um, great pictures of that. Um, the, the oceans are globally connected as well. We have this uh, summer hairline circulation of water going through the whole globe nearly from Antarctica. And when we warm the waters, when we warm the surface waters, uh, it will take hundreds and hundreds of years, but that water will travel through the whole ocean, basically, and it will have long term effects, what we're doing right now. So the reason really that we as, as a foundation are trying to link Antarctica into the in existing climate justice movement is because we really believe it is linked. It is linked to all the human industries and to our behavior and to the societies around the globe. So. Um, on our website, which is going to be redesigned very soon, um, there's a link now in the chat. You can find information about the Action Day. There are several things that you can find. Um, for example, some information about some threats to Antarctica and what is going on there generally. There's information how you can take action on the 23rd. That means, I think, because of COVID still for many people, it will mean uh, engaging with social media of course, on that day, but calling out the Antarctic Treaty nations for their greenwashing, telling them they have to do climate action if they really want to protect Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. But then also we have stuff like, for example, a nice uh, penguin stencil with a climate crisis message that people can use as a sort of easy artwork to reproduce. You can download that from the website. You can also sign up or email us if you're planning some sort of bigger action. Um, we have in this action document quite some ideas what people could do and we are also happy to help with it. And um, yeah, there's either an email address of my colleague on the website, but there's also a formula which you can use. You don't have to put your name in, you can just um, put any name in and, and contact us for questions or how to organize. Um, of course, one of the big things we are going to organize against in Australia is that huge airport project because it is so massive, increasing the human footprint by 40%. 
But on the other hand, it is also geopolitical. And that means that we expect if this airport project comes forward and Australia will build it, it will take about 10 or 20 years, then other nations uh, will probably apply for similar projects. That means the US could build something like that or China or the UK. And then we'll have many, many more projects like that. And of course, um, a rising impact of um, yeah, human footprint. And um, most the infrastructure that is in Antarctica at this point, most of the stations are in some very small area, of course, on the coast mainly, mainly on the ice-free areas. So when you think the whole continent is quite big, Actually, in terms of biodiversity, the biodiversity is mainly on the land, is mainly located on these ice-free areas, and they're very few. And they are com being competed with, for once, by the scientific stations, and on the other hand, also by tourism. And that is also a problem that actually not many NGOs are addressing. But the numbers of tourists have been rising in the last decades really quickly. Before the pandemic, we had about... 50,000 visitors to Antarctica per year. And that does not include the crew of the ships. So if you would add the crew of the ships, I'm thinking it's about like 70,000, but it's like 50,000 paying tourists. And of course, this is a luxury market. It's not something that um, many people can afford. Maybe middle class or upper middle class from the global north can afford that if people really want to, but it's not a cheap holiday. And what is particularly shocking about that is that there are scientific um, papers who uh, have calculated the carbon footprint saying that uh, the average travel, including your flight, with a standard seven to nine day voyage to Antarctica on a ship, from South America emits 5.5 tons of CO2 that single holiday. And then we have to see in comparison that people in Bangladesh on average use less than a ton of CO2. Actually, that single uh, voyage to Antarctica for a tourist um, consumes as much or emits as much carbon as eight people in Bangladesh emit in a whole year. So from a moral perspective, that sort of tourism should actually absolutely not exist at all. It's one of the luxuries of high consumption on this planet that we will need to totally scale down in the future if we want to keep to the Paris Agreement. Another issue which occasionally comes up, of course, in Antarctica is fishing. Um, fishing is mainly done only for two commercial species. One is toothfish and the other one is krill. Uh, toothfish is a species that is getting quite old and has a high commercial value. So um, it is sold in restaurants for, I think, something like 60 or $70 per kilo. It is also not something that the average person consumes. It takes a lot of emissions to take a ship and sail down there and catch that fish, which does nothing for food security. Also papers are there which are saying all the high sea fishing which we see in the world today actually does very, very little for food security. But this particular toothfish is really a luxury market product, which we would not need to fish at all. On our website, there are some links like which nations are fishing and, and stuff like that, and you can find more information. Particularly interesting, on another hand, is the fishery of krill. Krill are the tiny crustaceans, which are um, the base of all the food web in Antarctica. The whales eat them, all the other predators like the penguins, the seals, and so on. And it is expected that their hatch rights uh, at the juvenile stage uh, will decrease massively by up to 50% until the end of the century if the temperatures of the ocean keep warming if the sea ice is shrinking because they need the sea ice in their juvenile stage and if the ocean acidification of course is, is changing. So all these different factors combined will have a huge negative impact on the krill populations and therefore knock on effects on the whole uh, ecosystem in the Southern Ocean. So at the moment, the fishing of the krill is just 1% of the population, which is not so much, of course, 
but the problem at the moment is that it's sometimes too concentrated around certain uh, places. Um, particularly, there can be impacts if the ships take the catch too close to penguin colonies while the penguins are breeding, for example. So then there have been impacts on, uh, on the seabirds, really. But generally, that amount of krill catch is supposed to be sustainable, but it really depends when and where you catch it. On the other hand, what is really interesting about it is the fact that krill also does absolutely nothing for food security. Because there's hardly anyone, who, humans, who consume that directly. What is done with it, it's um, turned into other products, it's turned into krill oil for health products, not only for humans, but also for pets. So you can give it to your dog, you know, you, somebody catches it in Antarctica and then you give it to your dog as a health product. Or on the other hand, it is turned into a supplement for fish feed and often used in the salmon industry, in aquaculture, for example. So it's not that you can um, feed the salmon only krill, but maybe five or 10% of that mixture with which you feed of the fish feed can be krill. And that also uh, changes the color of the salmon, for example, when, you know, so, so it gets this rosy or orange color. So krill is another fishery that actually we can make an argument nobody needs because it doesn't do anything for food security. Um, we don't probably also don't need that salmon aquaculture. But what is very interesting, and again, when we're talking about connections here, is the fact that the same big fishing company in Norway, which is fishing that krill, it's called Eka Biomarine, is part of a bigger company, the Acre Group. And Acre is a fossil fuel company. They're, they are part of the fossil fuel industry since forever. There's another subgroup, it's called Acre BP. Of course, they have an oil field together with BP and so on. So it's a company which uh, often from their biomarine, from the fishing site, will tell you how green it is that they're using new sorts of fuels for to make their ships greener when they sail down to Antarctica. But on the other hand, another part of the, that same company is producing fossil fuels or um, involved in the fossil fuel industry until today. So what I want to say with that, anything that we see in Antarctica, we have to check for the greenwashing as well. And there are many, many problematic things which are happening in Antarctica, while not so many people um, are maybe paying attention to it. Another issue which comes up more often is the designation of protected areas. There's quite a lot of NGOs which are um, advocating for more marine protected areas because actually, even though a lot of people think the whole of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean is protected, that is actually not the case. So, um, Within that system, it is possible to have spatially protected areas where fishing is not allowed and also terrestrial areas where, for example, then tourists couldn't visit or science can't be carried out. That could be the case, for example, at important breeding sites of birds. But we have to see that the designation of these protected areas falls much, much lower than the average of protected areas worldwide. So, for example, um, the target for protected areas globally, um, terrestrially and in the water was something between 10% and 17% for the last decade. Antarctica terrestrially has like one or 2% protected and marine, it's about the same. Um, there's of course many different arguments to be made about protected areas. It's a whole different issue and I think um, can cause many, many social problems as well and has to be looked at very carefully outside Antarctica because it can cause a lot of problems with indigenous peoples and local communities. And this has been a very colonial project as well. But just to give you the perspective that for Antarctica, the protection of the place itself, apart from that it is stated that it is protected, 
and a nature reserve and has intrinsic value and all the nice words are on the papers the protection itself is actually not really effective particularly when we look at the climate crisis so um, once again that's kind of where we want to come in and where we want to put some pressure and make some changes and where we hope that we can bring that into the climate movement at some point and um, raise the attention and bring it in into the yeah with the justice aspect as well which it certainly has yeah so on on the website you can find information and you can get in touch with us but you can also um, use the moment to ask questions right now if you want to um, just contact us in the chat you can still also of course um, yeah contact us with questions to the other speakers I don't know if um, any one of you Hilda Thomas or Alejandra also wants to add to what I just said or make it make a reply please just unmute yourselves and go ahead and add something if you want to Maybe just a short sentence to what you said earlier about Antarctica being connected to like all the other latitudes on the planet. So it's not just this thermohaline circulation. So global warming is basically shifting wind systems on the southern hemisphere. And these wind systems, they are basically the drivers behind this thermohaline circulation. And around Antarctica, warm water comes up and warm meaning like three degrees, but for glaciers, that's pretty warm. And due to these shifting wind systems, more of this water is surfacing uh, close to these glaciers, underneath these glaciers. So this water can, due to the shifting wind systems that again shift due to human-made climate change, uh, more of this water can erode these glaciers and then destabilize them and raise global sea level faster and faster. Yeah, maybe we'd just like to, yeah, to say, uh, yeah, to, well, I don't need to encourage you because you are <laughs> pretty enthusiastic about it already, but I think that what you're pointing to is really important, which is the big mismatch between how we think of governance of the environment and uh, how incredibly inadequate the instruments are. Uh, and I think also Antarctica is a very nice case to just show how this happens, not just in Antarctica, but everywhere. So if you have a, an environmentally decent country in a way, but they are just in the wrong place, tough luck. Uh, and uh, conversely, uh, so I think that this just shows how we really need to think again, how to think of natural resources and how to administer them uh, wisely. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we still, it seems, don't have any questions in the chat. If anyone wants to ask, once again, feel, feel free. Um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, I can only encourage people once again to have a look at the website, read through the materials and just um, contact us because we're happy to provide more information or action ideas and yeah start start building a movement of people who occasionally um are will dedicate some time to putting pressure on the ats system so the first day that we want to do that is obviously now on the 23rd but also later in the year there will be the meeting about the Marine Living Resource Management, uh, which is not a particularly nice name, that takes place every year in Australia, in Hobart, where the Bob Brown Foundation is based. Again, it will be online. But that, for example, will discuss the marine protected areas, and that also will be the anniversary of the environmental protocol coming into force. So that, once again, will be an important moment for us internationally to raise the issue of Antarctica and yeah, as I said, we're really, we're really committed to um, moving things forward in, in that space and uh, trying to be a critical voice in, in that process because we really have to do so many transformations in all the ways that particularly industrialized societies are organized and we just cannot allow that a system like the ATS um, just continues doing the way 
it has always done. We need to be critical and we need the civil society to come in and, and put pressure at all the places. Yeah, so because no one has questions, I would then close this webinar. Thank you so much for your time. It yeah, was really great so to well. hear from you. And yeah, then we have put links everywhere. Also links if you want to follow the speakers or see more of the work, what they're doing. And yeah, I wish everyone a nice evening and hope to see you again. Thanks very yeah, much. Thank so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.